I, I'm kind of of the opinion that modern life induces something like gender dysphoria in almost everyone. <laughs> huh. I <laughs> right? love like, that. More. I want to hear more. <laughs> yes. But, the, you know, the basic things, I always think when you look at a list of sort of ways to resolve depression and anxiety, the list of things that you're advised to do are basically the list of things that would comprise a standard hunter-gatherer day, right? Like being outside, exercising, socializing with other people, sitting around a campfire, you know, all, all this kind of stuff, which which people which people have hormonally respond to really positively, but which 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 aren't a part of a standard modern day. And so for men, you know, that includes things like hunting and fishing and like being with male friends and all this kind of stuff, which which they are largely denied. And right. similarly for women, like I, I, it is very, my strong intuition, for instance, that one of the things that is driving the famed poor mental health of teenage girls, it is Instagram and all of this kind of stuff. I agree with that. I think it's also that teenage girls historically would have spent a lot of time around young children. Would you like to know more? Hello, everyone. We are super excited today to be joined by Louise Perry, who wrote The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, a book that really got a lot of people talking for the first time about things just not really working for women, in addition to things not really working for men in modern society. Plus, she is the podcast host of Maiden Mother Matriarch, one of the fastest growing new podcasts recently. So it, it's a great re and listen and, and basically she has the best guests on. So please do check out that podcast as well as the book. But today, and, uh, hold on, hold on, just for framing for audience, if you haven't heard of her, because you're just mentioning books and stuff. She's probably the most influential conservative influencer in the UK right now, in terms of like <laughs> conservative social ideas, intellectualism. She's the big wig right now. And she's really been moving the bar forwards on a number of issues. All right, You're so very kind. <laughs> hey, no, we were just in, in London for a week talking with a bunch of people who are in influential positions of society. And when mm -hmm. we talked with people about like, well, who is the public facing, you know, leader of, of, of modern conservative thought moving things forward? We heard your name. So oh, the you topic well. of today is going to be the future of women, mm -hmm. like where you think the future of women is going. And this is in the context of fertility rates because obviously the future of women is hugely going to be determined by the types of women who actually have kids. So first, I just love your initial thoughts. I mean, we can talk short-term, long-term, right? Like I think we can talk like what works now for having kids, how we can we motivate individual groups now for having kids, and then we'll go into the future. Where do you think women are going to be in 100 years? Where do you think women are going to be in 500 years? I did a debate recently in LA organized by Barry Weiss and the Free Press about the sexual revolution and Grimes, who was, I was debating against, had this great line where she, we were just kind of running with the whole, was the sexual revolution good or bad for women? And Grimes just said, you know, if women still exist, of course. In like it's a, a good decade. comment. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And it was like a funny comment, but also an astute one, because obviously biotech is all to play for, except, I mean, as I'm sure you'll both agree, we are at this very difficult potential bifurcation point where we could go ever more down the biotech route and you know upload ourselves to the cloud or whatever which i have my misgivings about you know and i've one of the things for instance i've i'm i'm skeptical of is some kinds of some kinds of repro tech i'm more open to others we can get into it mm. that's one route that we might go down as a species as a civilization the other as as we all know is that actually birth rate the birth rate problem leads to such economic stagnation such civilizational decline that we never actually we don't actually make any technological progress that actually we end up stalling at the mm -hmm. end up going backwards i don't really know which is going to happen i mean i suppose it's plausible that, that both might happen that you might end up with kind of high-tech enclaves in some parts of the world that's our which, camp. Yeah, yeah which get ever more like a like byzantium or something right you know civilization retreating to very very high tech and relatively stable and affluent enclaves while everywhere else unfortunately experiences the effects of low birth rates maybe i don't know maybe that's the route either way it's obviously going to have an enormous effect on yeah it's here's a question I have for you because i actually see a third path right so i mm -hmm. think that there are there, well, I mean, there's, there's, I, I think you're going to have some people trying for each path. Like, obviously, we, 
Simone and I are part of the cultural group that's tying for the ultra high tech pathway. <laughs> Whereas we see you and you can correct us if we're wrong as sort of, and, and, and we, we frame all of the different cultural approaches to fertility rates right now and family right now as hypotheses. Mm -hmm. and, and, and time will judge which hypotheses are intergenerationally stable. One that's very obviously intergenerationally stable, which you called out as well, are these xenophobic, technophobic, and, and generally economically unproductive cultural groups, which they will definitely exist in the future. Just how much they matter depends on if anyone else still exists. But I sort of have always seen you as representing something quite in between the two not the aggressively technophobic and xenophobic group, but of a group that represents sort of more wholesome traditional values. And I'm wondering if you are representing that group, how do you see that group as, as sort of recruiting and staying stable in a world in which they increasingly, and, and you could say this, is, this won't happen, but I, I sort of see increasingly they won't have control over governing systems that they live under. So how do they protect themselves in environments where there's hostile governments, et cetera? Like, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I mean, I'm quite agnostic on this question and I think about it a lot. I think it's a very difficult one. And I guess it's partly because I am, I'm sort of culturally Catholic in the mm -hmm. sense that I have, an enormous number of Catholic friends and I, I and I, I often find myself kind of circling back to Catholic ideas around that that feel intuitively true to me mm. but I'm actually an agnostic I wasn't raised Christian alone Catholic and so I don't I I therefore don't feel as if I'm completely beholden to what the Catholic Church says on things so for mm. instance I am I am sympathetic to IVF in particular instances I'm, I'm potentially sympathetic to polygenic screening I'm much less sympathetic to surrogacy. So I kind of, I, I, yeah. I go, I, I can go either way on some of these biotech questions. And I suppose that the question for me and a question for all of us, it's a really difficult one, is if you have a, so, that, so let's talk about polygenic screening, for instance. As far as I'm aware, the position of, the, the sort of mainstream Christian position on this is anti because it involves the destruction of embryos, at least in its current yeah. you know, incarnation. And also because, you know, tinkering with the genome is something that a lot of traditional Christians yeah. are, are very suspicious of. But then I also figure that the reason that we've got to the point where polygenic screening may well be necessary is because we've done this miraculous thing in dropping infant mortality to almost zero from a species norm yeah. of maybe 40 to 50 percent. Right. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing that medical technology has bestowed on the world. It also means that we have this crumbling genome problem, which I'm yeah. sure you'll be familiar with. I'm sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. And our will be audience familiar is definitely with. we talk about this. Right. Yeah. It's something that I think a lot of when you're talking about people who aren't our audience, like the general public, they don't understand that that just about three or four generations ago, about 50 percent of kids were dying before the age of one. Like this right. is not distant history when you're talking evolutionarily. But right. anyway, continue. We're, yeah. So we're basically keeping the infant mortality rate artificially very low. And there are problems downstream from that in that you now, you know, if we were to suddenly whip away when Western medical technology, which might happen if you have sort of catastrophic economic decline, loads and loads of people are actually not well enough to survive. And we end up with all of these um, uh, uh, uh genes for disease propagating mm -hmm. themselves in a way that they wouldn't otherwise right and i, I think okay if you sit <laughs> how do how do say christian principles that go back yeah. two thousand years contend with this kind of completely novel problem which is which is a product of technology mm -hmm. and i suppose my argument to people who would hold the more traditional view is you know i hear you i think that rapid technological change is risky and the precautionary principle sort of demands that we be that, that we be very suspicious of te rapid technological change as a, like an instinctive conservative that's my position but also the situation we're in is we have problems generated by technology that can only solve by, be solved with more technology yeah. and so the choices we have to make therefore are like okay we, we you know take sort of basic christian ideas which i i, I hold to right that feel mm -hmm. instinctively true to me but then we have to be trying to apply them to incredibly novel modern questions so, so yeah, as you say, Malcolm, therefore, I guess in some sense, I'm somewhere between the two extremes. 
Yeah, well, and I think something that I always note with the IVF stuff is it's a really hard thing to to make a call on when you look at, especially the groups that are against it, when you look at how much human fertility has declined in the last 50 years. You know, sperm rates are down over 50% in the last 50 years. You know, testosterone is down 30%. We've got endocrine disruptors in our environment, which are changing the way gender is presenting. Mm -hmm. Like, it is dramatically harder to naturally have kids for us than it was for our grandparents. And it's going to be harder yet for our kids because it's the one blind spot that, like, the environmental movement just completely ignored, which is one of those things where where it, it's sad to me because I actually culturally really – uh, like you, I, I, I feel simpatico with the groups that are even sort of antagonistic to this technology, but I do worry for them. Yeah. Okay, so I'll propose a very, uh, I actually have no idea where you're going to fall on this question, because it was a really interesting thing. So you guys might not know this, Luis Perry put together this conference, or was one of the key people at this conference called ARC, which was like a conservative-leaning Davos. Now, they don't say conservative-leaning, they say just an alternative, but it was it was for a, a lot of thinkers in the space. And at one point during it, artificial wombs came up. And somebody was horrified who I was talking to because they were a very traditional conservative woman. And they were like, well, if there's artificial wombs, then why do we even need women? Like, that's the most anti-feminist thing I could imagine. And I remember thinking, I was like, yeah, but like, is that like, I, 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 I guess I just didn't understand what was so existentially bad about that. Like, I assumed most people identify more with like, their family or their culture than their gender but she very clearly was like i am a woman first and then my culture and family like what do you think about artificial wombs and what do you think about worlds in which it does turn out to be healthier to maybe just ate a baby outside the body like what do we do in that world and 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 how do you would you like restructure the family in any way do you see that world as horrifying like yeah i'd love to hear more I think it was Jermaine Greer who wrote many decades ago that if, if we ever invent artificial wombs, then patriarchy will just sort of stamp women out. I'll have no need for us anymore <laughs> and we'll like, it'll be game over. I don't agree with that. I, I'd say that's a very paranoid sort of reading. <laughs> I, that's, that's not what worries me. I mean, the main thing that worries me about artificial wombs is I think that I think mothers are, are extremely important to not just you know physical development of infants but emotional development of infants and I worry terribly about it just seems like it's it it, it frightens me in terms of the how much could go wrong during the experimental development of such technology yeah. I mean what 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 may happen right is that we we already are able to sustain embryos in vitro for quite a long time you, you have incubators for for increasingly premature infants you know maybe they eventually meet in the middle without the need yeah. for any kind of radical experimentation so that you know and 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 obviously there are good reasons to have both of those both of those forms of technology <sighs> would i want to restructure the family my my instinct is to say no i mean one of the things that sets me apart maybe a little bit from other conservative commentators is that I am very interested in evolutionary psychology. I think that mm -hmm. evolution psychology has a lot to teach us in terms of how we reckon with rapid social and technological change because my, my sort of guiding principle is that our environments might change enormously but our minds don't change that much and the more you learn about how the human mind works and how human relationships work and so on the more you realize that actually sticking to the old ways there's normally a very good reason to do that which is not to say that we reject change full stop it's not to say we reject technology full stop you know going back to the infant mortality thing I love the fact that you know I don't have to worry about about losing young children to preventable disease you know this is this is, this is miraculous stuff but I think that efforts to tinker with the family for instance I mean like there's there's so much fascinating data for instance on the importance of mothers and fathers to, to child development mm -hmm. The sort of instinctive stuff that you don't yeah. really know is going on. Like Erica Commissar is coming on my podcast soon. She's so interesting on this and on the necessity of like fathers playing with children, you know, mm. mothers doing the soothing brow stuff. All this stuff that we do instinctively is actually so essential to developing a healthy person, which is why efforts to radically alter the family so that you don't have ma maternal and paternal presence stably in the child's life are so unwise so you know maybe there's a scenario where 
we have artificial wombs available to relieve women of the the pain and difficulty of gestation but i still i think that you know assuming that the child that comes out of that artificial womb is psychologically normal they also need basically a psychologically normal social experience going forward so yeah. i don't think that means i don't think that would be any reason to tinker with the family so a side cult question or related question to this because i asked my wife this recently in a world where women just like assuming like we had artificial women or something like that in a world in which we don't need women to have kids. What are some of the things, because you're talking about evolutionary psychology, that you think women do better than men? Like, what areas would a biologically modern woman always outcompete a biologically modern man in, in, in terms of utility to society? I can't remember where I heard this from, so I might be getting it wrong, but I, I, I believe that um, in terms of the ability to read other people's emotions... Oh. And a 130 IQ man is comparable to a 70 IQ woman. So like, so <laughs> I like, couldn't believe that. <laughs> right. <so> like, <laughs> Checked out. Like an intellectually disabled woman can read someone else's emotions better than, you know, a highly gifted man. Right. Just one example. But that the that's that one that really rings true actually it's funny when I talk to my husband because my husband and I are both quite typically feminine and masculine like the only mm. way in which I'm probably unusual for women is I'm quite contrarian but, but apart from that um we're both quite typical and he, we will often have this scenario where I will like in, interpret someone's emotions and he completely misses it because of that gap yeah. like and, you know, mm. that's that's one example of it I mean I I, I often say right I... the thing that has like undermined men the most in the modern era the thing that makes men feel as if they are superfluous because in a sense sometimes they are mm -hmm. is not feminism it's actually it's actually economic change it's actually the fact that we now have a service-based economy mostly which doesn't need male muscle but does need um the conscientiousness and agreeableness that women tend to manifest more of yeah, we we have a sales org within our company and, and women perform outperform men, at least for us within the, the sales organization that we have. Right. And it's it's something you point about. Like what are the the male traits where I think pretty undeniably people would say men do better? You know, whether it's it's physical strengths or bravery or courage, like these are yeah. things that are not as rewarded. And and in the industries in which they are rewarded, men vastly outperform women in terms of, and that's why you see these high death rates in these industries. I also really like sort of your framing as women as sort of the emotional custodians of our species and, and our culture, which is a, a very interesting take. I think that it's also a, I mean, it's, I'm writing an essay at the moment. It sounds like a joke, but I, I'm kind of of the opinion that modern life induces something like gender dysphoria in almost everyone. Huh. <laughs> right? I love like, that. Say more. I want to hear more. <laughs> yes. So an example would be, you know, the male drive towards be, doing sort of outdoor physical stuff like the, the, I mean, you don't want to be too reductive about it. Obviously, there are changes. There have been changes to our psychology since we left the savannah. You know, obviously, we're not exactly hunter gatherers psychologically. Mm -hmm. Evolution can 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 act surprisingly fast sometimes, right? But the, the, you know, the basic things. I always think when you look at a list of sort of ways to resolve depression and anxiety, the list of things that you're advised to do are basically the list of things that would comprise a standard hunter gatherer day right? Like being outside, exercising, socializing with other people, sitting around a campfire, you know, all, all this kind of stuff, which, which people, which people have hormonally respond to really positively, but which, which, which aren't a part of a standard modern day. And so for men, you know, that includes things like hunting and fishing and like being with male friends and all this kind of stuff, which, which they are largely denied in a very gender neutral modern economy which also in which the extended family has basically collapsed as well that's something we can also go into right because that's very relevant to the whole birth rates question and right. similarly for women like I I it is very, my strong intuition for instance that one of the things that is driving the famed poor mental health of teenage girls it is Instagram and all of this kind of stuff I agree with that I think it's also that teenage girls historically would have spent a lot of time around young children like one of the things that's very one of the ways in which teenage girls are useful in a kind of traditional setup, not even that traditional, right, is, is in providing childcare. And 
I mean, I, I'm also yeah. personally, I'm sure you agree that I've being around little children is joyful, right? It's like it is hard work yeah. and everything, but it is joyful. Like it gives you an intense yeah. sense of satisfaction. I always find that days when I, I really don't like traveling for work. I try and avoid doing it as much as possible because I don't like being away from my my two year old. And I always find that days when I have been just with him, not doing any other kind of work, they're tiring. Yes, but there's also a sense of like deep satisfaction. Whereas days when I'm not with him, when I'm when I'm off somewhere else, I have this sense of like just kind of bubbling anxiety. And it occurred to me that this is gender dysphoria, basically, right? Like my, what what my huh. what my mind and my body are longing for are being around my children I I <coughs> this is it's it, it I don't want to compare it to the gender dysphoria that people like that that trans people experience yeah. can be very very acute right and I don't doubt the existence of that kind of gender dysphoria it's clearly real what I'm talking about is a kind of so, environmental mismatch which I, I causes mild anxiety and depression in both sexes so I think the term in in the trans community that you're looking for is gender envy which is you might in your environment see I idealizations or even in your head have sort of an evoked set of idealizations of what it means to be a woman, but you're not able to uh, enact those in your daily life, which is really fascinating. Another thing that you said that really had me reflect on something I hadn't realized before is you're talking about teenage girls caring for babies. Mm -hmm. And it got me thinking, I was like, okay, when does this care for babies response differentially begin to appear in women and i think intuitively i assumed okay it's around the age they would probably be having kids right like early 20s but then i thought i was like no prepubescent girls have this desire prepubescent girls have baby dolls that they care for like it is a very intense desire from a very early age for women which i think backs what you're saying there that that women are genetically sort of coded to care for kids even at a younger age and that the desire to be away from kids really only seems to get loud in women during the period in which they're trying to to distance themselves from their families you yeah know. i mean there clearly are exceptions there clearly are some women who don't have that much <clears throat> kind of maternal instinct which is no. presumably being heavily selected against right during the current evolutionary bottleneck those women exist those women are also disproportionately found in positions of influence because they mm -hmm. tend to also have more one they don't have like having children does delay your career progression it just does like there's a straightforward sort of collision between <laughs> the fa family life and the labor market but also because they're likely to have other traits that are more masculine in terms of being more competitive and whatever, they're more likely to end up at the top of the tree professionally. And it does, it is unfortunate because it means that, you know, one of my one of my friends who works in politics likes to say that probably the least well represented demographic in all of British politics, and indeed, you know, I'm sure politics elsewhere, are stay at home mums because sort of definitionally there are no stay at home mums in parliament. And it, it's also very rare to have, have even former stay at home mums in parliament yep. like it's just mm. not a group that you hear from and so the women who would say you know actually i basically get the greatest satisfaction what i really want to do is basically live a traditional traditional life you know be it, which doesn't necessarily mean you know let's let's always remember it doesn't necessarily mean the, the feminine mystique isolation in the suburbs life it's more like the being you know being around your sisters and cousins and looking after children yeah. right and kind of incorporating that with other work around around the the household like that that basic lifestyle setup i think actually a lot of women enormously prefer that to the girl this, boss life this brings me to a really interesting realization which is that if you're like promoting feminism if you look at where women are most discriminated in our society like the category or traits of women that are most discriminated in our society they are the traits that we associate with motherhood and with women who have gone down this motherhood pathway if you're at a company or you're in hollywood right like suppose we're screening for who gets to be the next big female star right you know they're looking for a woman who has small breasts and is aggressive and like doesn't care about children and like like there's a very specific type that hollywood is casting as the woman and then our society begins to build this is what a powerful woman looks like which is antagonistic to what I think many people would think of like a trad woman or a matronly mm -hmm. woman or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, mother matriarch, your, your podcast name. And this group of women is just completely ignored and discriminated against within even, even career environments because there's women who 
fall into these aesthetic and life choice trends, but who still have to work to support their family. And yeah. I think in those environments, they're often held back from uh, positions of influence or positions of being seen. And yet the modern feminist movement is not going to support those women or or call out this level of, the, the, like, we have no heroes right now. We have no heroes who are mothers. If you look at the strong women in media, they are not mothers. They are not mm -hmm. taking on a feminine role. Well, or if they are mothers, they don't talk about it. And they kind of mm -hmm. have to not talk about it or they won't be able to advance easily. Well, so when I want to hear more from you. Yeah, we... One thing I'm really curious about, Louise, is what you think would be ideal for women in the future. There's like a lot of dystopias that we're really afraid about, right? We're afraid about women's reproductive freedom being taken away as, as nations get desperate for taxpayers. You know, I mean, China's already starting to revoke access to vasectomies and birth control and abortions. So like we're getting there. We, we know what we don't want. And, and Malcolm and I have a vision for what we want, but it is much more extreme than, you know, generally your take. So we're curious to hear you know, the reasonable person's take on what is an ideal, we'd say pro-woman future, you know, in a hundred years or so, in 50 years or a hundred years, is it more structured or less structured, more strict or less strict? Are women in the home or are they given tons of choice? Like, what do you think would lead to the best outcome? And obviously what's difficult about this is that sometimes that doesn't sound like the best or most politically palatable today, but like try to like try to tell me what you think would be best for women's actual mental health, thriving society, et cetera. It depends on the age, doesn't it? I mean, that's one of the, the, the reasons I chose the name for my show, this recognition mm. that women have quite distinct stages in their life cycles, which mm. men don't have to quite the same degree, like being a maid and being a mother, being a maid shark are quite different states. Mm. And I think one of the, one of the mistakes that that liberal modern society makes in relation to both <clears throat> young men and young women, but I would say maybe more young women because one of the really distinctive features of, say, teenage girl psychology mm -hmm. is being extremely impressionable. Mm -hmm. Teenage boys tend to be you know, reckless or, or like various, you know, mm -hmm. they, they have their own, uh, they have their own challenges. Teenage girls, and I say this as someone who used to be a teenage girl, <laughs> are, are, are very, very susceptible to peer influence. And one of the mistakes that I think we make and that I wrote a, a lot about in my first book is, is, is granting actually too much freedom to teenage girls to do really self-destructive things. Mm. The challenge there though, and, and so many parents, who I speak to are sort of like they they do know that they do know that actually a 15 year old girl cannot actually make good sexual choices for instance right it, and it's kind of crazy to expect her to and we only let 15 year old girls make independent sexual choices because we have access to contraception and abortion right in any other circumstance where, where those sexual choices are likely to lead to a baby that's the community's problem mm -hmm. like there's so there's so much more limits placed on your woman right right but obviously there are enormous costs to that. I think you describe it in your book as the hard societies. Am I remembering right? Yeah, hard yeah. cultures. Yeah, like, yeah, hard cultures are, 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 are hardcore, right? <laughs> like, and, and we, and I, and I very much enjoy not living in a culture where I'm that, where I'm that constrained. Mm -hmm. It's a really difficult balancing act because you need, you need cultural templates. You need guardrails. You need certain expectations that are kind of socially enforced. What you don't want is, you know, Iranian morality police or whatever. Yeah, well, and, and I think something that you're catching there when you're talking about the three stages of a woman's life is that organically a society, you know, you talk about evolutionary psychology, two men, a maid, the maid stage of a woman's life is always the most valuable because that's the stage like if my wife died, the women who would be most attracted to me would not be women of her age. They would be women with the highest fertility window, like this due to evolutionary reasons, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm a guy and I'm going to get distracted by a woman in a billboard, it's going to be a young looking woman, right? Yeah. Who doesn't look like she's had kids with someone else because that lowers the woman's value to me as a, even a potential replacement for a wife that I've already had. Mm -hmm. So what they just sort of organically society is always going to promote that one stage of a woman's life and therefore women can think then to be a good woman i must be the optimal maid the perpetual maid yeah, yeah yeah exactly and i think that one of the one of the ways in which our culture is not well set up for family formation is that we do encourage perpetual maidenhood 
even though it's not possible. I mean, it's kind of partly possible through contraception and Botox and whatever, but like not really. Like there is a, there is a shelf life. Well, you can't pull it off. Like an yeah. argument that that I've had friends make to me that I think is really compelling is you can be you can get the best plastic surgery. You can be mm. have also just have won the genetic lottery, but if you are a 45 year old woman who looks amazing, she's you're still not going to beat a you know 23 year old 21 year old girl. Like yeah, so it's a losing game. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. No way and, to it's a, and I think it's a very psychologically damaging game to try and play because you do reach this point when you're in, say, your late thirties, yep. where you know that you're losing it and you sort of have no other source of status. And 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 a lot of this is to do with the fact that we don't assign enough status to mothers. Yeah, which oh, completely, yeah, in, yeah in, within no, feminism, no motivation except mostly, yeah, yeah, yeah. right, 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 yeah. right. So a healthy culture would be one where there are life stage specific cultural expectations that are enforced through norms not through laws hmm. i suppose because i because the law is a very blunt instrument whereas cultural templates can be potentially malleable you know i want there to be like we we we, we all recognize you know like the what's the stonewall line gay people exist get used to it like that's true you know yeah. it, it is true that 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 like that homosexuality is present across human societies and indeed across other other species right and you need societies that can say simultaneously it's really good to get married and have children but also not persecute people who don't because mm -hmm. they're because they're gay or lesbian right and that's a that's a challenging balance and it like you, you look around at cultures around the world and there aren't that many that manage to properly strike that balance so it, like we have a real task going on. it's funny you should mention this because mm -hmm. we have culture warriors in our society that are doing this so when we were in london we did a, a show with uh, pearl davis a just pearly things show yeah. and one of the segments of the show was just showing the audience pictures of women who were mothers or who were middle-aged in and married in scantily clad outfits that they had posted to like Instagram and mm. shaming them for it. Really interesting. It was like seeing that what that <clears throat> mechanism right there. And it wasn't even like them posing in a slutty way or mm. anything. It was just like, you know, you are middle-aged, you're a mother, like, should you be wearing a bikini and posting mm. it on social media? It wasn't just wearing a bikini. It was, should you be posting a picture of yourself on social media wearing a bikini? And I never would have made that connection. Asking, oh, God, that's so funny. Yeah, yeah. Well, and she did it asking, which I think was an important question. And I think in a way, you know, even more base than us, because Simone, even you were like, well, I think it's okay within the rules of our existing. I, or I might have been that more. Simone was a little more harsh. But but she was pointing out, she's like, if they're posting something like this and they're already married, they're posting this for sexual validation from other men. Like, that's what this is about. And we do need to shame that as a society. So that was interesting. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the painful truth is, and I'm, I'm kind of reluctant to completely spell it out because it, it, it does upset people, rightly, is that, you know, slut shaming, for instance, is a social, is a, like a social technology, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's hard to persuade, going back to the impressionability of teenage girls, right? If you're trying, if you really, really want your daughter to make good sexual decisions because you have the, the recognition of how consequential those decisions are, right? Even in a world with abortion and contraception, you know, going back to the wrong guy's flat could be potentially lethal, yeah. aside yeah. from all the other distress that it can cause. If you really want her to make good sexual decisions, you, you, you can try sitting her down and saying, here are all the terrible things that could happen if you make bad sexual decisions. But knowing teenagers as we do, we know that that's not very likely to actually make much of an impact on her decision making. Or you can have a culture of slut shaming, which is what like most cultures come up with. And it's enforced by other teenage girls. What's and so like, and it's and it's quite and it's like ugly and painful, which is why I'm I'm, like, I'm reluctant to like endorse it. But I am saying that this is like that is why such such social technologies exist for precisely that purpose. Yeah, and there's this really big tension between what I see is like more liberal culture, you know, like let people have choice, let people mm -hmm. do what they want to do. But then what has sort of become what Malcolm has honed in on is like the progressive movement's biggest value proposition now, subtly, which is that you need never feel pain in the moment. Like do whatever makes you feel good now. If something yeah. triggers you, don't engage with it. If mm -hmm. someone's bullying you, we will stop them. And there's this ins insane tension where like you, you can't have a, a well-policed society. You can't prevent people from doing bad things without either having an insane law, which is 
probably not ideal because then you're actually taking away people's rights or mm-hmm. shaming them, like you say. Mm-hmm. And it does, it's, it is really interesting to like, you know, hear you describe on one hand, you know, like a very reasonable, like let's, you know, socially police thing policy. And then like to hear Malcolm reminding me of this example of like someone on the internet who's seen as extremely controversial, like extremely controversial shaming women and like Mm. that feeling so i remember sitting in the show like at the moment being like oh wow we're doing this this is okay Mm. this is i mean it's crazy yeah i mean like sort of uh, traditional slut shaming cultures combined with the internet is a particularly ugly product right because Mm -hmm. because it's enormously magnifying the 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 audience and the and the consequent distress to the women so Yeah. yeah i mean i'm not i'm also not posting middle-aged ladies bikini pics and kind of encouraging people to make fun of them but it's been wonderful to have you on we'd love to have you on again this has been fantastic and i hope all of you have a wonderful day yeah and don't forget to check out maiden mother matriarch and the case against the sexual revolution where you get a lot more nuance on these subjects so if you like the conversation don't worry there's tons more